Welcome to the Maine Science Podcast. I'm Kate Dickerson. One quick note before I introduce our guest. The next episode will be released in three weeks on December 2nd, so we can avoid having an episode released on Thanksgiving Day. After that, we'll be back to our two-week schedule. Today's episode is a conversation with Dustin Updike, an associate professor at MDI Biological Laboratory. Dustin's work looks at how stem cells maintain pluripotency, the capacity to become other cell types in the body. Dustin's enthusiasm and love of science and his work shine throughout this episode, and I was really happy to learn more about what he and his lab are investigating. I hope you enjoy it. Dustin, welcome to the Main Science Podcast. It is a pleasure to have you. It's good to be here. I know uh, you are currently in net, well now, at the MDI Biological Laboratory, and, and we will get deep into your work and, um, Pat, you know, listeners of this podcast know how much I regard the work being done there. I think it's um, unfortunately a, a little hidden secret of a hidden gem of main science, and actually I would argue worldwide science. But before we dive into that, I would love to know how you, you know, how you, how did you get the science bug? We can go as far back as you want. Sure, let's do it. Um, so I grew up in rural Wyoming. Um, we lived about 45 miles away from my grocery store in a little town, and and so it was primarily uh, agriculture, ranching community, um, oil field uh, area, and. The school that I went to was a K through 12 school, and I think that um, most of my interest in science probably came from um, just a series of good mentors. And so, uh, when I was growing up, um, my uh, our science teacher, she was a high school science teacher at the time, but she was involved in 4-H and other activities. That would, and she would pile us in the back of her truck and we'd go and collect rocks and fossils. And, and um, she was the person that, you know, when I found a, a worm with two tails on it, I brought it to her lab one time. And, uh, and so she really encouraged us to um, get creative and explore unknown things and, and um, push the science fair program quite heavily. And so I think from, you know, the sixth grade through high school, I had a science fair project every year and, and I uh, had the opportunity to go to um, the International Science and Engineering Fair one year in Tennessee. And, and so that was a, a really fun time when I think back on it, um, just because I, I was creative and, and got to uh, explore some different topics and learn about things each year. So then I went to college at the University of Wyoming. And uh, while there, I was really focused on, you know, what, what is the job that I'm going to have? You know, what, what is it that I'm going to be able to do? And I, uh, switched my major a couple of times, I think. And, and at one point I went to my advisor and it was right after I had shadowed a urologist. And I really, what I learned was that this wasn't going to be something for me. <laughs> so he said, you know what you should do? You should talk to um, this uh, professor, Peter Thorsis was his name, is his name. And he does this great research on um, discovering what the mitochondria does, and he uses baker's yeast to do this. And that seemed really bizarre to me, but I went and talked to Dr. Thorsis, and he let me work in his lab for a couple of years. And um, I, I think at that point, I, I found that, you know, this is my element. This is, you know, bringing back some of those uh, science fair memories from my early childhood um, and letting me be creative and explore things. And one of the things that um, a geneticist is trained to do is just to do, I think, um, forefront discovery science. Uh, you often hear it called basic science research. But in Dr. Thorsch's lab, I, um, you know, he would come up with these ideas to do different screens and selections to identify new genes, genes that haven't been explored before. And I remember at one point asking him, um, you know, what percent of the genes do we know something about? And I think at the time, it was, you know, like about 50% of them. And so I saw the opportunity, you know, there are thousands of genes that we know nothing about. How do we get at those genes and how do we understand them a little bit better? And so he also led me uh, into this idea that you can go to graduate school and, and kind of um, have a career answering these kind of questions. And so I went to graduate school at the University of Utah and worked with um, uh, Dr. Susan Mango there. Um, she's a, a MacArthur Fellow, brilliant person, and again, answering questions about um, 
the basic science of how genes work and what their function is um, and how organs come together, uh, how multiple cell types are given an identity to become an organ. And we did that work in C. elegans, these little nematodes. Um, it, the genome sequence was relatively new at the time. It was one of the first multicellular animals to be completely sequenced. And what we could do is answer these questions really quickly that we that people couldn't address in other experimental models. Um, and the, 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 uh, but at the same time, the genes that we were finding there that regulate these processes actually regulate the same processes in humans. All right, I'm gonna make you stop just yeah. for a second. Yeah, I have thank a you. Million <laughs> questions. No, you're good. So just to remind those of us who haven't had biology in a long time, I, I wanna go back to the mitochondria and baker's yeast because you said you did that as an undergrad. It sounds like it was your first really intensive science research that was with a mentor. Could you just talk about that a little bit? Like, what does that mean? Yeah, so, you know, it was unfamiliar to me at the time too, um, but uh, Peter was um, funded through the National Institutes of Health, which is something that I was introduced to at the time um, to do this important work. And um, and so I would go into the lab and I would learn to, how to, you know, grow yeast and, and put them in, on different Petri dishes with different chemicals that would allow them to grow in some conditions and not in others. And um, you, you can get really creative. And I, you know, at the time you'd often hear the, the awesome power of yeast genetics. And so yeast are... Um, are eukaryotic cells. And so they have a lot of the same genes that we do, um, but they grow, you know, they have doubling times of an hour or two hours that, you know, one, that one cell will form a next. And so you can do a bunch of genetics with it, um, set up an experiment and know the results of the experiment the next day. So it's kind of a neat thing to learn about. So yeast and then the C. elegans, right? That's what... C. Uh, elegans. Uh -huh. C. elegans. I think most people are surprised when they hear about or are reminded that these still multicellular but very, very tiny uh, critters have some of the same genes that we do. I'm just going to dive right into your work here mm -hmm. or, or some facet of your work. Does... I know that they don't have as many genes as we do. And I also know that there's a ton of genes that humans have that we still don't know what, if any value they have. Do they? Uh, but, but they do have as many genes. So do they have as many? I guess maybe yeah, that's my so, question. So, okay. you know, so C. elegans has 20, about 21,000 genes, and that's about the same number of genes that humans have. We used to have fewer genes, depending on the species, um, from, you know, 4,000 to 14,000 or so. But... Um, that, yeah, that's the, the miracle of all is, of this is that, you know, and at least with C. elegans, about 50% of those genes are, are conserved um, and ha have the same function as they do in humans. Perfect. So that's actually, I'm <laughs> glad you corrected me on that. You said they have the same function. So if you, if you change one of them or alter or learn about one, does it have, is it exactly correlate to us or are there differences depending on the gene? Right. Well, it all can depend. Um, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. And so, you know, we, I think the National Institutes of Health, they know that um, in order for us to understand and be able to address and formulate a hypothesis to test whether something can cure cancer or not, um, we have to have that foundation of um, knowing about basic gene function first. And, uh, and so, Miraculously, when you look at, you know, the, one of the biggest cancer signaling pathways that's mutated in, in almost all cancers is the um, MAP kinase signaling pathway. And um, this pathway was discovered and, uh, in, in C. elegans in these little worms. Um, it was uh, some weird observations from a, a guy who later uh, received a Nobel Prize for some of the work, but he was able to take a phenotype in these worms, a trait in these worms, and find the genes that were regulating that process and mapped them all out. And lo and behold, they're conserved in humans and in humans, they're regulating cancer. Um, the same can be said for, you know, the, another thing they found were um, programmed cell death genetics was discovered in C. elegans, or um, the insulin signaling pathway was primarily worked out in these little worms um, before it was 
apply to what we know about humans. So that is just both wicked cool and an excellent example of why foundational and basic research is so important. If, if you need to find a reason why it's important other than it's just cool to know. Um, so yeah. <laughs> uh, when I interrupted you, you were in Utah with, uh, with yep. it sounds like a pretty extraordinary uh, research project and advisor. I'm going to just make you jump forward a little bit and, or at least tell us how you, how Maine got lucky enough to get you. Yeah. So I'll quickly say that um, that advisor, you know, when I was thinking about research topics for my postdoc, which is where you set up the things that you'll bring to your own lab. um, She said, you know, one of the really unexplored questions are these things called germ granules. And um, they are these, you know, at the time, and it was this, you know, kind of an anomaly that we didn't really understand. And and instead of thinking about how genes are functioning and regulating processes within the nucleus of a cell, um, there are all these other processes outside of the nucleus and the cytoplasm of the cell that are regulating the cell's ability to do different things. And so I went to um, the lab in UC, at UC, University of California in Santa Cruz to do my postdoc with um, Susan Strom, who had discovered these germ granules in C. elegans. And, um, you know, common theme, these germ granules were also in our reproductive cells. And so <clears throat> when you think about the different types of cells in the human body, um, there's really two big groups. They're the cells that make up the bulk of us. Um, they're going to differentiate into different cell types, and then they're going to die when we do. Um, and then the other cell type are the cells that become our, our gametes, our, our egg and our sperm. And those cells, even though they have the very same DNA as the rest of the cells in our body, um, those cells have an immortal potential. They have the ability to give rise to all of the cell types of each subsequent generation indefinitely. And so what we found is that these germ granules, which are only present in these um, germ cells or the precursors to our our eggs and sperm, um, are regulating part of that process and are giving them that potential to be immortal and to be what we call totipotent or stem cell like. And so part of what we do in the lab is to understand what these granules are doing and how they're doing it. And it's a, you know, it's a really fun process for me, you know, just come up with ideas and um, work with my group and find out, you know, how we should tackle this problem. So can you walk me through that? Like, what is that? I, I get the whole coming up with ideas part, that part's really cool. But how do you, what does it look like? And maybe not day to day, but, you know, month yeah. to month or, or project to project, which is probably a better way to think about it, right? You have grad students and postdocs. So how do you, how do you devise, how do you figure this out? Well, I, I kind of take a multifaceted approach. Um, the, there's a high risk, high reward component to a lot of the genetic screens that we do. And um, what I do is I take the opportunity to get my trainees to do these high risk experiments. And so the undergraduates that I bring into my lab, you know, they, even if it doesn't work, they're going to learn a lot of genetics really quick. And uh, they're going to use, they're going to know about um, how genes function and they're going to learn how to do things like CRISPR. And it's kind of a crash course for them. And a lot of times it doesn't work, but sometimes it does. And so, you know, the, the very first undergraduate I had in my lab was um, a student that grew up in Blue Hill, Maine. And, you know, he came that summer and in two and a half months, he had identified 19 different mutations that mapped to four different genes. And so, you know, I at that point gave a part of those projects to a graduate student and a postdoc in my lab. And they followed up on those and published, you know, eventually published that work. So I don't always tell my trainees that they're getting the hard stuff, but that's actually how it works. That is a crazy mm. amount in two and a half months. Yeah. Just, yeah. And that was just identifying them. And then, like I said, biology was certainly not my strong suit. You identify them, but then you're the more advanced students figure out what does it mean and what do they do? That's right. So uh, identifying them is really a short term for, um, uh, what I'm calling a genetic screen, and so or mutagenesis. And so, one of the beautiful things, of, there's a lot of beautiful things about these little worms that we work with, but one of them is that 
we can, um, with CRISPR, we can put fluorescent tags on any gene that we want and light them up. And these worms are transparent, they're small. Um, we can grow thousands of them on a Petri dish. And so what we can do is um, a, a student can come in at the beginning of the summer and expose these animals to a mutagen that it will randomly mutate all 21,000 of those genes. And we can then look at the worms to find, um, you know, in that case, I just said, you know, look for germ granules, you know, look for germ granules that go away or germ granules that got bigger or smaller. And so uh, when they do that, they find all of these need, need um, um, phenotypes or differences in the germ granules. And then we can cross them back to another strain and actually map the gene that's actually causing these attributes. Uh, so when I was in graduate school, that process of mapping the genes took about three years for me to map my first gene. Um, but now we have these um, sequencing technologies that um, we can actually identify from the mutagenesis to the screening um, and to the identification of the gene in about a month or two. Um, it's a fast process now. And, and so... Um, and the other thing that I like about it is it's completely unbiased. So often we don't know what we're going to get. And so we get this gene that is causing this difference in the germ granules in this case. And uh, we d often don't know what it is or uh, it's often, it often doesn't have a name. And so we have to, you know, name it. And, and, and that's how that, you know, a gene gets into the system often. How long is the lifespan of these, of these little worms? Um, well, the generation time, which is important for us, is about three or four days. Oh, so that's why you can do this that's over why the span you can of two this. and a half you months. Can, yeah. You can do a mutagenesis. You can clone out the, the, the children of the worms that you mutated. Um, and then you can screen the grandchildren of those worms um, in a two-week span. And so, um, the, so that's quick. The longevity of the worms, they uh, can you know, live for uh, about... 20 days or so normally um, under certain conditions, they can go into an alternative dour state and they can live for months at that stage. So if you wanted to, sorry, I know I'm, I'm going to get ahead. back to your actual work. If you wanted to, you could do the mutations and then you get another generation three or four days later, but then you could, you could see what the mutations, how they play out over the rest of the lifespan of the worm. Yeah, too. exactly. Um, and so that's part of it. You know, we, uh, the interesting ones we continue to follow up on and, and learn about them a little bit more. We're trying to get a, a publication from one of our screen hits. Um, it's a gene that we named uh, Loader1, L-O-T-R-1. And um, we've got some Tolkien fans in the lab. I was about to ask. <laughs> <laughs> but, you know, this is a, a gene that has um, impacts in regeneration in humans and also in the development of, um, of sperm and sp spermatogenesis. Uh, but you can't hardly, you know, it's very difficult to study in mammals. You can't get at it. But here we, you know, we're describing it and it's actually under review right now, under revision right now at the journal. Um, and we've got the preprint of it out. But I think that, you know, what this allows us to do is we discovered that that the protein that the gene makes is um, a part of a different um, subclass of granules. And we've identified the partners that it's working with and, you know, its function. And, and um, those are things that you really couldn't do in another more complicated animal, but uh, I'm almost would guarantee that those functions are going to be conserved. That's really cool. Okay. So I know you're not looking at the entire cellular structure of the, of the worms, you're looking at specific bits of it, right? And, right. and seeing what, so why don't we, now I will finally let you um, <laughs> talk Get about your work design. explicitly. Um, <laughs> and and I'm, I'm going to assume that you did your postdoc in, uh, in Santa Cruz, um, right. uh, home of the banana slugs for all that's those sports right. fans <laughs> out there. And that's what kind of laid the groundwork for you to come to MDI Biolab. Does yeah, that's right. Um, it was a, a fun place to live. We um, enjoyed living by the ocean and we thought we'll never get to live by the ocean again, but um, we found this beautiful place in Maine and, and uh, now live by the ocean again. So yeah, so S Susan Strom um, discovered these germ granules in C. elegans um, 
and published them in 1982 with uh, her advisor, Bill Wood. And they are really, really beautiful. Um, so they, uh, and you can see some of these movies, I think on my webpage, but they actually segregate at, at, when, you, when you fertilize an embryo um, in C. elegans, um, you can see the granules and they're a little bit everywhere in the cytoplasm. But all of a sudden they end up on one side before the first cell division happens. And then before the second cell division happens, they end up in, on another side. And so these granules, they were, they're actually going to be segregating to the germline blastomere or the cell that becomes the, the germ cells or the, that will become the egg and the sperm of that next generation. And so um, I think the first couple of decades, um, the real question is how do they segregate to that one specific cell type. And so a lot of genetics and screens were done on that um, before my time. But with the advent of high throughput RNA sequencing and a lot of different genetic tricks, um, the completion of the genomes, um, and more recently CRISPR um, Cas9 technology, we can really do anything we want with the genes that are that are involved in this process to understand their function. And so one of the things that I got to do when we first got here to Maine was to uh, develop a technique that would remove these germ granules, that would get rid of them completely. And that thing, it, it's a complicated thing to do because we know now over 100 proteins that are part of these granules and getting rid of just one of them won't granule completely. But we figured out a way to do it. And when we do this, what we see is that the cells that are supposed to turn into oocytes or sperm, um, they'll start expressing neuronal genes, that they'll start expressing muscle genes, and they um, will actually send out neurite like uh, proje uh, projections, kind of like you'd see on an axon of a neuron. And so without these granules, the cells lose that um, immortal and totipotent potential, and they start to differentiate and turn into uh, specific cell types like the rest of our body does. And so this was one of the first things that really showed us that, you know, these granules, they, they are part of the answer here. And, then, and if you look back at how stem cells are made, um, often we hear about these induced pluripotent stem cells, but Another way to make stem cells is through somatic cell nuclear transfer. This is the technology that was used to clone Dolly the sheep, for example. And so uh, if you think about the cloning of Dolly the sheep, a nucleus from a, a differentiated cell was put into a germ cell. And it, within the context of the cytoplasm around that nucleus, there was something special in that germ cell cytoplasm or germplasm, we call it. Um, that could reprogram that nucleus to become more of a stem cell and to, you know, to become uh, an, another sheep or a clone of the sheep. And so what is it in the germplasm? You know, there's the, diff the differences in the germplasm. And we think that, you know, these germ granules that are in the germplasm of our reproductive cells um, hold part of the answer into the the regenerative potential or stem cell potential of a cell. Um, and so this is why, you know, one of the reasons we we're funded to do what we do. I'm just trying to make sure I understand the, the, the germ cells that you're looking at, right. Mm -hmm. Are analogous to stem cells in mammals or are they both stem cells? Well, um, the, the germline stem cells are the quintessential stem cell. Of an animal. Regardless of right, they give rise to all the cell types, right? Okay, and so they uh, do some special things. Um, they after they divide, uh, they undergo meiosis, a process where the the DNA is separated into four gametes, and and then after that, fertilization happens. But um, that special process, you know, it goes through that. But uh, these are the cells that have that immortal or totipotent or stem cell-like potential. So they, they are very much a stem cell. Okay. And when you say regeneration, that, that's what you're studying. Are mm -hmm. you trying to figure out how you're going <laughs> to see my ignorance on full display? Are you trying to figure out how to keep those immortal cells going forever? Or are you trying to figure out how to have 
the immortal cells give that capability to the other cells? Well, I think that there are a lot of answers to that question. And the first, awesome. uh, you know, wh what happens when we lose that immortal potential? So if our germ cells lose that immortal potential, what is the consequence? And the consequence is a loss of fertility. Um, it, it's, you know, kind of, it, that's the end of that generation, right? So that's one reason why we're trying to understand germ brain function is to understand fertility. Um, now, the other end of things, what happens when these components of germ granules that get expressed in cells where they shouldn't be expressed. And um, in, you know, in 70% of melanomas, um, they re-express some of these germ granule components. 40% uh, of breast cancer re-express some of these proteins that are only supposed to be expressed in the reproductive, uh, in, in the germline. And so uh, the, the other end of it is, you know, when, when you get these things in cells where they're not supposed to be, is there a way to turn them off? And, you know, that's our, that's our cancer angle, I guess. But the other, the third angle then is what if you had like a rheostat to dial these properties on and off at any given time? And, you know, in that regard, um, that's what essentially what regeneration or regenerative medicine is trying to do a wound and that wound needs healing, um, can you do something to kind of de-differentiate the cells so that they can give rise to the cell types that are needed to regenerate um, the, the wound or whatever is missing or the cell type that is not no longer present? So that's looking down the road. And so like I'm saying, we're laying that foundation, but the implications are, are there and quite obvious, I think. So how my mind is, is reeling with possibilities of how on earth you pick <laughs> on any given project, which end of that you want to learn about and how do you yeah. go about that? Yeah. Um, so uh, we, you know, we take the low hanging fruit first. I think that's the answer to it. I'll give an example. This summer I had, I had six undergraduate students in my lab and I give them each a gene um, that we had found through a, another biochemical assay that is interacting with a pro one of the core germ granule proteins. And then after they, you know, we got their gene and could find out where the gene was being ex expressed, where in the cell, is it in the cytoplasm or nucleus or on the plasma membrane, you know, after they find these things out, um, <clears throat> we can pursue it a little bit more. And so one of them that we found was um, one that we were kind of had on our radar before. And uh, a postdoc in my lab has picked up that project now because we found a really neat expression phenotype in that um, this gene, which is involved in human embryonic implantation, it turns on just within a few days window and allows the embryo to implant. And so, um, but, you know, as you can imagine, trying to understand how that process works in humans or even in mice is a, a difficult thing. But now we found out, you know, how it turns on really rapidly. And, you know, we're trying to ask the questions now of uh, how, how that process is facilitated and what the, pro what the role of germ granules in the germline is uh, in that process. And so... This is a, a new area of interest that just started this summer, but I think that it's a project that'll take off. Um, another project, another postdoc is working on um, is finding out the domains that are concentrated in these granules and what properties they give. And what if, what if these domains are in different proteins? Um, do they allow for the assembly of different liquid phases within the cell? Um, that can respond to heat stresses and other things. So it may seem a little bit unfocused, but it's all coming back to the same, uh, you know, what is the function of these germ granules? And we can just get creative and, like I say, take the low-hanging fruit first. So I, I have two questions. One is, do you always pick genes that have some, that, that align with uh, those found in human processes? And then the, the second question, which is probably easier to answer, you said you gave six undergraduates a gene each to study. Would that have even been possible 10 years ago to do in a summer? It wouldn't have been possible three years ago. Wow. 
Okay. So, <laughs> um, in fact, I probably couldn't have done it before two years ago. Um, the, we, we, with CRISPR, um, we developed some new tools this back, past couple of years that we um, published. It's a split GFP technology that we did in collaboration with, um, with Cynthia Kenyon's lab and some others at, and blanking on the uh, Google's um, aging group and some from the Chen Zuckerberg Initiative. And so we did this collaboration to allow us to rapidly tag genes using the split GFP system. I won't get into it. Um, but this allowed me to, you know, give a project to a summer student and tell them to design the CRISPR reagents that you're going to need to use to do this. And then the reagents come in a week and then they can start putting these reagents into the worm to do the CRISPR to actually add the fluorescent tag onto the worms. And so that's um, a little bit more, it has been a little bit more involved process in the past. And before CRISPR, it just really wasn't possible. But And just to remind people, CRISPR is, for all intents and purposes, a way to cut and paste yep. genes so, that aren't usually supposed to be where they are. It's a word processor for your genome. <laughs> awesome. Cut and paste. Got it. So in the last couple of years, you've really been able to up the science game with the undergraduates because of the incredibly fast evolution of the tools that we need to work at a molecular That's level. That's right. Yep. Okay. That's right. And I took the opportunity, I run a short course through the Embry program, and I took the opportunity to um, develop a CRISPR Cas9 course because I think it's important for undergraduates in the state of Maine to know about how to do this and to be able to put it on their CV once they do. It seems like it's a pretty critical technique that you have to know nowadays to really yeah. dive into research. So, right. which go, so back to my first question before we got diverted on the amazing technology, um, the genes that, that you assign and that you pick, do you know from the beginning that it's going to have some type of connection with human genes? And I don't know that I think that that's important. I'm just curious. Well, we look for conservation and we prioritize those genes that are highly conserved just because, you know, it's, we want to see the implications. So often we've studied some nematode specific genes uh, and those are kind of interesting, but I think they're more interesting if they're going to tell us a little bit more about human development. And So what do you mean by conservation in that sense? Yeah. So, you know, we, through the process of evolution, um, we're all related and, and um, all of our, most of our genes are, um, the important ones at least are conserved, um, meaning that, that the same gene exists um, in humans as it does in like these nematodes we work with, with some minor modifications often. But um, if you look at the overlap of the protein structures, I mean, it's essentially making the same product in almost all cases. And in fact, you can often take the human gene and replace the worm gene and it'll function just fine. So we, we do have a selection process that's prioritized to, to genes that are conserved in humans. We have a lot of things that don't work out too. And so, you know, we, we like to have our hands in a lot of things and because a, a lot of them don't really progress to make a good complete story and we can just, you know, save those for later, or toss them to the side um, and go off to go after the important ones. So how, Difficult is it for you to get the point across, especially to undergrads, that failure is a critical component of science? Right. That, that's really something I think that most learn in graduate school when 80% of their projects don't work out. Um, uh, and it is hard to teach this to undergraduates because um, often I find that my, my summer students, for example, will come in. And um, in the second week of them being here, they'll say, you know, my project's just not working out. And I'm trying not to smile because, you know, they've only been there two weeks. And, and so uh, often the projects don't work out, right? Um, so out of my students this summer, there were a couple that got their lines, but you couldn't, they, they weren't expressed at a level um, that w was bright enough for us to be able to see the protein. And so that's unfortunate, but, you know, they, the experience, um, they had the same kind of experience as the ones that got theirs to work. So what happened when you were in grad school? I'm fortunate enough to have experienced this 
not by getting a PhD, but by watching my husband and a million other people get PhDs. Yeah. And, you know, you, I could almost time when, <laughs> when the crash and burn was going to come with every project, regardless of the field they were in, um, <laughs> which was fascinating to be an observer to and not have to actually experience myself. So you must have run into that as well with grad school. Yeah. I mean, it's a roller coaster ride. Um, uh, but, you know, you, it's just part of the process. And I think that what it does is it gives you confidence in the scientific method. You know, if, if, if everything that we came up, thought up worked, you know, that, uh, you know, how confident would you be in that case? But, you know, if you see that only a fraction of your ideas are actually right, then often even if they are right, they're right in a way that you often don't envision. Um, and so I, I like that. Um, I like that experience. And so for me, those experiments that don't matriculate, sure, it can be a little discouraging, but at the same time, you know, it just, it makes me love science even more um, because it's, it's a good way to find out how things are actually working. And it is a way to kind of take our biases out if it's done the right way. Are other people in your family scientists? Or are you are you the no, only I'm one the who's only gone one. this route? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, do, have you had a hard time explaining to them this? Like, it's a, it is a wildly frustrating field to get into at times. But it's it, with with all of the coolness that you said, right? Like, it, it, you understand mm-hmm. the scientific method, you understand how it works, and then you have these great aha moments, whether something works or not. But it's it can be really hard to explain that to someone who doesn't, un, yeah. who, who hasn't experienced it, like everything, <laughs> right? I'm not saying that that's it's unique to science, but oftentimes you're also trying to explain it in a vocabulary in a language that is not the same, right? You have to figure out a way to talk to them that doesn't involve that's right all the language that you have to know to talk to your colleagues. So has that been what has that been like? <laughs> Yeah, so this it, this is always a challenge for me, not just with my family, but for everyone in general. It's hard for me to remember when I used to not know some of these words, and so I think that um, often, you know, when I start talking, my my family kind of humors me, I guess, and they just get excited when I do and get discouraged when I do. But um, uh, they, you know, I. I've really tried to work on this. I have a long way to go. Now, some scientists are really good at communicating with the public a lot better than I am. Um, and so, I, for example, I um, had a postdoc that um, just took a position uh, last year at Hudson University, Elizabeth Marnick. Uh, and she, you know, she has used Instagram as a format to actually reach out and communicate a lot of science topics um, about the COVID-19 and other science topics and does it in a way that I could never do. And so, you know, I, I'm one of those that I'm better sometimes shut in my office thinking about things um, while others can go out and, and help the public a little bit more because it's not really one of my strengths, but I'm working on it. I, I'm understanding what you're saying. So I don't think that, I, I think you're, you're selling yourself short a little bit, but I also <laughs> think there's real value in knowing what you're good at and knowing what you have to work on and, mm-hmm. um, and recognizing that sometimes you're not the best person <laughs> to explain something. I think that that's really good. Um, but I think also it's a really good example that uh, you're going to fail, right? I mean, um, and, and you learn from that and you figure out how to go on enough about your, my psychoanalyzing you here. Um, <laughs> with your projects, you, you do have a lot going on. It's, it's, um, I find it fascinating that, you know, when I step back and, and don't think about the science so much, but just think about these little worms, all the different things that we can learn from them. I'm going to ask this knowing it's like asking you to pick your favorite child. Do you <laughs> have any projects of late that you have found just wildly exciting, either because of what they tell you or because you didn't expect it to be like that? Um, yeah, I mean, there, I, I've got a lot of them and I'm trying to think of, you know, which one that I'm interested in. There's, um, the, you know, this, this project that uh, I talked about uh, with um, the, the fertilization and implantation gene is one of them, I think, and 
the other one that I've been really excited about um, is uh, uh, that another postdoc in my lab, Emily Spalding, is taken off with. Um, she is looking at the role of these domains, uh, these disordered domains that are found in germ granules and how they organize organelles within the cell that are not bound by a membrane. Uh, so one of these organelles is in the nucleus. It's called the nucleolus. It's a, a an or it's the organelle that it, uh, I'm trying to think of the right wording to use it. Uh, it it helps with protein production in the cell. Um, it takes it's the it's the center of uh, assembling the machinery that turns um, mRNA into protein. And so you know she is found all of these mutants um, within these domains that kind of blast this nucleolus apart or put it together or decide which domains of the nucleolus should assemble together and which should assemble, you know, in, in contrast to that. And so I think that'll be a really fun story when it comes out soon. How did you find that? Um, that's not really an easy one to, again, it was, um, uh, we were looking at this gene uh, that was highly expressed in the germ cells. It's one of the most abundant proteins in the germ cells. And initially it looked like it didn't have um, a counterpart in humans or mammals, and which we thought was really weird. You know, if you have something that uh, is one of the most abundant proteins, it should be really important in other animals as well. And it turns out that we just um, didn't have the right bioinformatics tools, it was evading detection. And so what had happened in nematodes is one end of this protein got swipped, swapped to the other end. And uh, what we found was that it was actually um, what we called a homolog or, or a duplication of a copy of a, a gene in humans called um, nuclear one or nucleolin. And, um, and so she found through this that this nucleolin is the same nucleolin that exists in humans. Um, but now she's attributing some function to it. Um, she's finding out what, uh, what its role is and how it is compartmentalizing the nucleolus. So that's an exciting story. That's really cool. I, I'm fascinated that it was the, it was the, that you couldn't detect it. And then as soon as you figured that out, all of a sudden this, the cliche yeah. of the light bulb going off, that's yeah. really neat. Before I let you go, I would, I would, I want uh, you to give you the chance to talk about Ember. Am, am I Embry? saying that right? Mm -hmm. Embry, sorry, Embry, uh -huh. and your role with that, and then kind of what that what that project is and what it means for Maine. Yeah. So what Embry is, the main uh, Embry is the um, Idea Network of Biomedical Research Excellence. Um, we have a great web page um, at uh, mainidea.net and embry.mainidea.net. What this is, is this funding from the uh, National Institutes of General Medical Sciences. And it allows um, states that don't get a bulk of the federal research funding to actually have a part of that. And so it's a really, it's a big grant. And it's one that I'm, um, Jim Kaufman is the principal investigator on it. And I'm a program coordinator for it. Um, but it essentially brings in, uh, you know, $18 million dollars into Maine that gets partitioned out to 14 different undergraduate institutions within Maine. And, and it facilitates um, research projects that um, allow these campuses to hire researchers who are doing really quality science and that will be competitive for federal research funding going forward. And at the same time, it provides a mechanism to bring uh, an authentic research experiment, experience to undergraduates. Um, at those different campuses. And so the, the reach is far and wide and, and um, it improves the research infrastructure, often um, allows these uh, places to get the equipment that they need to do the research that they need. And then um, it has a focus on improving the research training and research workforce that we have within Maine. And so the undergraduates that come through the Maine Embry program will work in research labs at their institution or at summer fellowships like um, in, with groups like me or others here at MDIBL or, or Bowdoin or Bates and, uh, at these different campuses. It is a wonderful thing for the state of Maine. It builds our workforce. Um, 
I just ran into a couple of my students from Machias at Martin's a couple of days ago. And I, you know, I see, I see them matriculate through their programs and want to know what the next step is. And this really help that I, I feel like it helps them get to that next step, you know, to apply and find the jobs at, at JAX or at other research institutions or different places across the state of Maine. So does it help with the networking and connections among the researchers as well? You know, we're, we're a big state area-wise and a small state population-wise, and it can be really hard to find colleagues sometimes. Does it, does it also help foster that? Yeah, it does. We have so many cases where researchers across, at different campuses across Maine are working with one another um, because of the Embree network that's been established. Um, we also have core facilities that are supported through funding from the um, Embry uh, grant as well. Um, so the one that we have here is we have a microscopy core, um, these really high-end microscopes. And we have uh, um, instituted a process where anybody across the state of Maine can mail uh, microscope slides with the images that they need to acquire to that facility. They can get the imaging done and um, they can also send students here to get trained on those high-end microscopes. Is that why you've got some of the coolest microscopic pictures around? <laughs> I mean, at MDI Biolab, like there are some gorgeous, gorgeous, beautiful yeah. pictures that come out yeah. of that lab. Yeah, so. Frederick Brené is the microscopy director, and he's just doing a wonderful job. But, you know, when my summer students come in, I don't have to watch over their shoulder to make sure that they're doing the right thing the whole time with these nice microscopes. I send them to Frederick and he, you know, trains them. And so we've got, you know, people that are, you know, undergraduates that know how to use confocal microscopes and spinning disc and two photon microscopes. The Embry also funds a a lot of um, the undergraduate programs that are at different institutions, um, like the Honors College at the University of Maine, for example, and some of the um, viral work that they do there. Dustin, this has been a delight. Um, I love being reminded of the connection between these animals that live for 20 days and us, and what we can learn from them to help apply it to each other. Um, But even more, I love, (laughs) you and I have never met. We've had a few email exchanges. You are so delightfully excited about your work. It is, um, I cannot oh, wait for you. people to hear. Uh, <laughs> I love, I love the image of uh, this guy who grew up in Wyoming ending up on the coast of Maine, super excited about worms. I'm pretty sure that that was probably not in your, <laughs> in your, your fortune telling of what you were going to do. So I really yeah. appreciate your time yeah. and your conversation. Well, thank you. It was a lot of fun. Thanks for listening to the Maine Science Podcast. Make sure you never miss an episode by subscribing on Apple, Google, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. And please leave a rating and review. It will help more people find us and help spread the word about some of the remarkable people doing science in Maine. The Maine Science Podcast is recorded at Discovery Studios, Maine Discovery Museum in Bangor, Maine. It is produced and edited by me, Kate Dickerson. I receive production support from Miranda Bouchard and social media support from Next Media. The Discover Main theme was composed and performed by Nick Parker.